points and some um, great ideas about um, pollinators. Um, so Annapolis Green has Elvia, who is, um, and I'll say it before she does, an electric car driver. So everyone should consider um, switching to an electric car. Um, they are great for the environment. There's a lot of um, a lot of uh, benefits to that. Um, I don't know if the pollinators can hear you coming though, but maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, so shall I turn it over to you, Alvia, and you can make um, some announcements? Thank you very much. Okay. Alvia, we're having trouble hearing you. This has been the night of glitches. <laughs> Much better. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Heather didn't introduce herself, I don't think, but she is the um, oh, Homestead, sorry. Homestead Gardens um, Education Director. And we are very happy to be partnering with Homestead Gardens tonight and appreciate all of you who are here um, on this lovely evening. Instead of being outside, we appreciate it. This is going to be a really fun and educational session. Um, so, um, a little bit about us. We've got a, a very, very short uh, video that we're going to present that tells you a little bit about Annapolis Green. Uh, Maggie, you want to roll the video? Sure. And while she's doing that, that is Maggie Hughes, who is working with Annapolis Green. Hi, everybody. Here we go. I'm Elvia Thompson. And I'm Lynn Forsman. Well, it was about 14 years ago when Annapolis Green got started, and our main goal is to energize what's going on in the environmental community and bring it to businesses, individuals, the government folks to really try and make it easy, accessible. We provide resources, we offer programming, donate, volunteer with us, come to an event. If there's an environmental topic that interests you, we've probably done some research on it. So have a look online at annapolisgreen.com. Let's all get together for the greener good. Thanks, Maggie. So one of the reasons that we were so excited about partnering with Homestead Gardens is that we have a program called Here We Grow that we're describing as a modern day victory garden, um, encouraging gardeners to, to um, plant not only beautiful flowers, but also vegetables and not to write, you know, put those vegetables out in the backyard like they're not pretty because they are but mix them right in with the flowers so we're talking about not backyard gardening so much but front yard gardening so here's another very short little video about here we grow grow something that's annapolis green's message for the spring join our here we grow program to get closer to nature Grow beautiful, native, ornamental plants and some of your own food right in your yard. Here We Grow is a modern take on the World War II Victory Garden. We are enlisting home gardeners to form a community in our area to share information, support each other, and garden a little differently. Don't push your veggies into the backyard. Put them right out in front with your native flowers. Be proud of growing food and providing pollinator habitat. Your neighbors will be amazed at your harvest, and the planet will be happy too. Whether you have acres or just a few pots on the balcony, you can grow flowers and food for a beautiful and delicious garden. For more information, see the Here We Grow page on annapolisgreen.com. So that's a little bit of uh, advertising about us, but of course we can have beautiful flowers or food for that matter if we don't have pollinators. So um, we have two speakers with us tonight. We have Luke Gombell, who is the vice president of the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association, and he knows all about these little critters who make food possible. Because you know what they say, no bees equals no food. And then after he talks about the habitat and all the issues having to do with pollinators, but primarily bees, that we're going to go to Kathy Gents, who is the editor, publisher, and founder of Washington Gardener Magazine. But Heather's going to do a better introduction of, of uh, Kathy in a minute. So let me tell you a little bit about Luke. Um, in addition to being vice president of the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association, um, he's a local boy who's raised in Baltimore um, and is a graduate of Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Um, and he has won a number of awards, including from the National Academy of Sciences and lots of other things. He worked on, on uh, space science um, at NASA after he earned his PhD in chemistry from Johns Hopkins. Um, and then after he, he was doing this and, and inventing things and starting his own company, he became interested in bees. 
uh, particularly because bees are on the decline. And when you talk about no bees, no food, that's a really bad thing. So um, he is on, Luke is not only involved in the raising of bees, but he's also um, a very um, active voice in legislation in the state of Maryland to protect our pollinators. So with that, um, Luke, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Alvia, for that great introduction. And I'm, I'm really impressed with, with what uh, Naples Green is doing. And um, it's very, very worthy effort. So now I'm gonna talk about pollinators. Um, let's see, I'm sharing my screen. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna start my presentation then uh, at the beginning. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, as Elvia said, I'm here to talk about pollinators. So, and she mentioned no pollinators. I wouldn't say no food, but I'd say food wasteland, which you'll hear about a little bit later. But um, so I'm going to start with something very uh, fundamental. I hope it doesn't bore you. What are pollinators? Well, pollinators. A pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. So the movement of pollen must occur for the plant to become fertilized and produce fruits, seeds, and young plants. Some plants are self-pollinating. Uh, an example, um, well, some, some others are pollen, fertilized by pollen carried by wind or water. And an example of a wind pollinated plant is the corn. Corn doesn't require uh, bees or anything to pollinate it. But other plants are pollinated, of course, by insects and animals, such as bees, wasps, moths, butterflies, birds, flies, and small mammals, including bats, which is pretty interesting. But um, I have a picture on the right here that shows examples of pollinators. And um, some pollinators, including many bees, intentionally collect pollen. And as a beekeeper, I know that I see my bees carrying pollen back into the hive. And what they use it for is to make what's called bee bread, which is fed to their, their uh, young, the larva. And without this pollen, they can't produce new bees. So um, others, other pollinators such, such as many butterflies, birds, and bats move pollen accidentally. That is, they don't gather it to take back and feed their young or anything, but the pollen sticks on their bodies while they're drinking or feeding on nectar in the flower blooms, and it's transported unknowingly from flower to flower, resulting in pollination. So as Elvia said, uh, pollination is essential for our food. And in fact, the USDA has calculated that one out of every three bites you eat is provided by the effort of pollinators. Pollinators contribute, and economically, pollinators contribute more than $24 billion a year to the United States economy, of which honeybees account for two thirds of that pollination through their vital role in keeping fruits, nuts, and vegetables in our diets. But their contribution isn't limited to to pollination of, uh, for fruits, nuts, and vegetables. They actually, um, some, some provide things like hay. For example, the alfalfa leafcutter bee contributes approximately $5 billion a year to the value of alfalfa hay. So I have here some pictures of what our um, grocer's uh, fruit and vegetable aisle would look like with pollination above and without pollination below. So we'd be missing a lot of fruits, nuts, and vegetables if, if we had no, no pollinators. So um, in fact, we'd lose 75% of the world's flowering plants and nearly 75% of our crops if pollinators were gone. And without pollinators, wildlife would have fewer nutritious berries and seeds to eat, and we would miss out on many fruits, vegetables, and nuts like blueberries, squash, and almonds, not to mention chocolate and coffee, all of which depend on pollination. Um, and here's a huge list of foods that depend on pollinators, but 
the point I want to make here is that of this list of 38 foods, including things like tequila, um, bees pollinate 35 of these 38 foods. So bees are pretty important. But I have a picture in the lower right of a bat that's pollinating something, which is pretty interesting that bats do. And on the left, there's a wasp. And of course, there's a hummingbird. That's how birds pollinate, like hummingbirds collecting nectar. So as I mentioned, it's not often said, we usually hear about fruits and nuts and vegetables being pollinated by um, flying insects, but it's also necessary for things like dairy products and meat. Without alfalfa or other feed that requires pollinated plants for feed, we'd have less dairy and we'd have less meat as well. So I'm gonna speak briefly about pollinator declines. That uh, photograph in the upper right is actually a photograph of one of my friend's hives, Bonnie Raindrop, who Elvia knows. That I took that photo of one of her hives that had, had died over winter. So that's just a lot of dead bees. Us beekeepers are seeing a lot of dead bees lately. The number of managed honeybee colonies in the United States has declined steadily over the past 60 years from 6 million colonies. That's what we call a beehive full of bees, one queen and all, all the worker bees, from 6 million colonies to less than half of that today. Now, and that was 6 million colonies in 1947 when we had half the population of the United States and um, the, the half the population we have now. So that's actually, we've got about one quarter no, of the number of col bee colonies, honey bee colonies per capita in, in the change from the last 60 years. Um, historically, beekeepers have lost about one in 10 of their hives each year. But since uh, 2006, Commercial beekeepers, beekeepers in the United States lose on average one third to one half of their hives each year. Now imagine if a dairy farmer lost half of their half of their um, cows each year. I mean, this is a tremendous burden for the um, beekeeping industry. And um, I know people that have lost all of their hives some years, which um, I'm included in that group. And in previous decades, queens, you know, each hive has one queen and that queen is necessary to replenish the supply of worker bees. The worker bees live about a month, a little bit longer, and then they die. But the queen usually used to live, if you read any books about beekeeping, they'll tell you three to five years. But now suddenly we're lucky to have a queen survive for even one year. We're replacing queens like crazy. In general, beekeepers struggle mightily to keep their hives alive. No queen, the hive, the population dwindles and eventually dies off and there's no hive left. left. So um, I'm gonna talk about threats to bees. What has changed since 1947? Threats to bees have been hypothesized to include or may include Climate change, change in land use, cell phone rays, parasitic mites, genetic changes, lazy beekeepers, indeterminate mystery disease such as colony collapse disorder, sunspots, evil spirits, and so on. But threats to bees that have been scientifically proven include pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, pest control, bare rose and flower care, coated seed, crop protection, treatments, mosquito control, lawn care, spraying, dusting, drenching, and so on. In other words, poisons meant to kill pests are killing our vital pollinators. In fact, there has been an explosion in the toxicity of the environment to pollinators since there has been an explosion in the use of such poisons since 1947, and especially in the last 20, 30 years, as you'll see next. So this is a bold claim to say that uh, we're losing our pollinators due to use of pesticides, but there's a great deal of evidence that supports it. And um, 
here's one example. And if you want to um, see proof for the things that I state, I've at the bottom of the page, if you want to do a screenshot or something, I have a lot of references of hyperlinks you can go to. There's been a 75% reduction in the biomass of flying insects over the past 27 years. We've just discovered this in the last five years or so. The studies have come out that show this, multiple studies. Now that means that we only have one quarter of the flying insects that we had 27 years ago. And you can see that for yourself. If, if you've been around a long time like I have, I mean, I remember going for drives in my parents' car in the 60s and 70s, and, and they would have to use a squeegee every time they filled up with gas. They'd use a squeegee to rub the dead bees, wash the dead bees off the windshield. So there's actually a, a, a lot of evidence for people reporting the lack of insects now. And um, more scientifically, the toxicity of the environment to bees has increased 48 fold in the past 25 years. Um, I don't mean 48%, I mean the toxicity to bees in the environment has increased not double or triple or quadruple, but 48 fold in the last 25 years. And this, uh, I'm having a speaker come to the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association, who was one of the people that published the first study that showed that. And now there's a corroborating, a corroborating study that came out just this year. I mean, last year, 2020. The world's most used pesticide, that's imidacloprid. It's hard to say, even neonic is hard to say, but it's of the class of systemics called neonicotinoids. The world's most used pesticide is thousands of times more toxic to bees than the already banned pesticide DDT. One pound, just one pound I could hold in my hand is as toxic as three tons of DDT. So that's more than the weight of a car. And another th th thing that highlights how, how um, toxic these new chemicals are. They were invented in the 80s. They started selling them in the 90s and they didn't really get up to speed until the last 20, 25 years selling this stuff worldwide. A single corn seed treated with this pesticide, that is 90% um, of the corn planted in the United States, which is the uh, first or second most common crop in the United States, 90% of that seed is sold to farmers as treated with neonicotinoid or some other systemic in the class of neonics. And um, it has one single seed is coated with enough poison to kill 100,000 bees. So imagine how many seeds are planted in this country. And that toxin has to go somewhere. Sometimes it accumulates in the ground and, and flowers will grow up that have blooms that bees go to and they'll, and they'll collect the nectar and pollen from the flowers. And, and if they don't die immediately, they'll take it back and maybe feed it to the queen and, and the queen will eventually die. So this is a big problem. So in, in light of all this, there has been some progress. The U European Un Union has banned all outdoor use of an entire class of pesticides, the neonics I was talking about due to its proven harm to pollinators. And this was just done, I think two years ago. I'm not sure, but I have a um, link at the bottom of the page. So what can we do um, here in Maryland? Just, you know, regular people. Well, the first thing is to be aware and care about pollinators. Educate yourself on pesticides. Be careful. There's a lot of industry misinterpret misinformation about pesticides and bees. And also be aware, be aware of greenwashing, where there's um, organizations that are set up that sound like they're environmental, but they're actually um, mouthpieces for the pesticide industry. So stop using insecticides and herbicides in your gardens. If you can't stop, at least try to limit their use to a minimum. 
and consider alternatives to chemical pesticides. I'm always surprised when I find out how um, there's wonderful alternatives to, to just using um, products bought off of, of uh, hardware store shelves that are full of really nasty chemicals. And support legislation to ban the worst offenders, for instance, neonicotinoids. I think there's a um, attempt to ban neonicotinoids throughout the United States. It's the um, American, American Pollinator Protection Act or something, but um, there's a national effort. Um, of course, I'll talk about what we've done in Maryland. I think it's the next slide. And uh, most importantly, I would say set an example there's no need to poison our land and ourselves to grow abundant, beautiful, or useful plants. So um, LB asked me to briefly talk about um, recent pollinator protection legislation in Maryland. And I'll start by saying Maryland is leading the way in the nation in saving pollinators. It's really good news. We've had four legislative wins since 2016. In 2016, we, we passed the Pollinator Protection Act, which prohibits the sale of neonics for lawn and garden use to all but farmers and registered applicators. It was the first such statewide ban in the whole nation. And as of today, there's only two states that, that have had even partial ban, bans like ours on neonicotinoids. And it made international news. So the other, the three remaining legis uh, legislative wins uh, I'll talk about now. In 2017, we uh, passed the pollinator habitat plans, which prohibits the use of bee-harming pesticides on designated pollinator protection habitats. That's like where the state plants flowers along highways and stuff. Um, and there's other places that are designated Maryland state pollinator protection habitats. So it's good to know that they're not using these chemicals that kill the bees there. In 2020, we banned chlorpyrifos or thought we did because the General Assembly passed a, a, um, a law that would um, prohibit the use of the pesticide ranked second only to neonic for its harm to pollinators. And um, it was vetoed by the governor but in its place, we got a regulation that will ban completely neonicotinoids statewide effective in 2022. And finally, this legislative session, we closed a loophole in the Pollinator Protection Act. There was a loophole that was that the Maryland Department of Agriculture was informing vendors that they could circumvent the 2016 Pollinator Protection Act simply by purchasing a permit that allows them to sell neonics to consumers. That will no longer be legal once this bill is signed by, um, it's passed through the, um, through the General Assembly. Once it is signed by Governor Hogan or not signed by Governor Hogan, we will no longer have this loophole. So we're awaiting what he's, it's on his desk and we're awaiting action by him. So, um, as far as legislation in Maryland goes, it's really true that your vote and your voice counts. So please urge your legislators to save the pollinators. It's working. And we're setting an example for the rest of the nation. Here you can see when the, um, the designated pollinator protection areas, uh, the prohibition of, of pea killing pesticides law was passed and Governor, Governor Hogan signed that into law in 20. 17. So finally, I have some further reading for anyone that's interested in reading some more about what I've been speaking about. Um, I've underlined Pesticide Conspiracy by Professor Robert Vandenbosch. It was written in 1978 and, and like Silent Spring, it was very prescient and still applicable today. He was a, um, the head of the entomology department at the University of California. And he wrote a, a, a lot about why we have this problem with this explosion in pesticide use. And um, finally, if you have any questions for me,
feel free to email me at vp at centralmarylandbees.org. Thank you. That was terrific, Luke. Thank you. Um, I just want to, we, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, but before that, I just want to let people know something that's not generally known. And that is that in Maryland, pesticides are not controlled by the Maryland Department of the Environment, but are regulated by the Maryland Department of Agriculture, which is not exactly always environmentally friendly. Let's put it that way. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about is, is that the, the pesticides are not only a danger to the pollinators, but also to the people who apply them and very significantly to farm workers. There's very little protection for farm workers. Um, it seems like they get hit from all sides. They're not getting uh, vaccinated to, at the same rate as everyone else. Um, they make very little money, live in crowded conditions, and then they're sprayed on basically. Um, so uh, just a little extra information there. So um, Luke, I have a question for you from Rita. She says, well, what about the neo neonics that, um, that are in the, the plants that are sold not in responsible places like Homestead, but in the big box stores? Is there any way that a consumer can know whether a plant has been treated that way? Unfortunately, there's no way to know. And when I was working um, with the Smart on Pesticide Coalition in 2016 to get the Pollinator Protection Act passed, one of the clauses to the act that was we had to remove in order to get it passed through legislation was a clause that would require um, people that sold plants to inform the, the purchaser that the plant was treated with neonicotinoids. So that was, we had to make that sacrifice to get even a little bit of the bill passed, unfortunately. But I just think it's almost criminal not to tell people what their plants have been treated with. We have found, I worked with Friends of the Earth and we did some uh, research actually testing plants for whether they had neonics or not. And it was surprising how many plants we bought from lawn and from garden stores that were labeled as bee friendly that actually tested positive for neonicotinoids, which is certainly not bee friendly. So um, it's, it's really important to talk to the vendors and question them and try to get to someone that knows whether the plants have been treated with neonics or not. And uh, we've got another question for you uh, real quick because we've got to get Kathy on. Um, but I also want to encourage everybody to stay till the very end because we have a raffle. We have a beautiful basket that we're going to give away. But um, another question for you, um, Luke, uh, real quick is, um, what are the different types of bees that beekeepers like to keep? Well, I, I think uh, the, all the bees that beekeepers in this country keep are Apis milliforia. They're all the same type. They have little different differences. Some are uh, yellower than others, the Italians and some are known to be a little bit more aggressive than others. Uh, for instance, the Russians, but um, <laughs> in general, the beekeepers I know don't care and, and we just keep mutts. You know, there are some mix of bees, but they're Apis millifloria, which is uh, known as a stinging bee. They're stingless bees in other countries, but we don't deal with them here. Okay, thank you so much, Luke, this was great. Um, Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I'm going to ask you something. Would you talk about, um, would you say that Homestead is not selling plants that are treated with neonics, so everybody's aware of that? Homestead is not <laughs> selling plants with neonics, not at the seed source, not at the young plant source. We certainly don't treat with neonics. Um, you can ask any one of our salespeople, um, because I not beat it into them, but I talk to them about the provenance of the plant material that we buy. Um, and I can tell you, um, Luke's advice is brilliant. Ask a vendor if you get a lot of, um, that's not your, that's not, that's not where you should be shopping for sure. For sure. And let me say we have in the past, I mean, as we evolve, as we educate ourselves, as our consumer becomes more educated, um, they demand the best from us. And the best from us is to be honest and transparent about where our plant material comes from. And if, if I mean, 
it's fringe money. There's nothing when you walk in the door, I do not sell milk. Well, I sell eggs, but I don't need, you don't need anything that I have. You want those things, it makes a better life, but it's, it's your extra, you know, money that you've kind of squirreled away for your gardens. And um, we appreciate it. And so we're partnering with you in your gardening success and we do not, will not, sell any plants that have been treated with neonix. How's that, Alvia? <laughs> Next thing I'm gonna do is buy a, an electric car. I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> All right, so um, that was an amazing talk and I'm just positively blown away by the amount of data. So um, I'll have to get some of those books I did read, um, Silent Springs. Um, I think I was very young when I read it and so I was traumatized. And but my whole life, I've never left a room without turning the lights out. And, you know, uh, we read yeah. uh, Silent Spring in our book club just last month, our, yeah. our Annapolis Green Book yeah. Club. And we have learned nothing <laughs> since 1962, <laughs> pretty right. much. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> I appreciate society. that. I, but each one of us can make a difference. And so and that's the kind of thing that um, that um, Kathy drives. So. Um, I, this is Kathy Jentz. She's amazing. I'm a huge fan. She's the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine. She also um, writes for the International Water Garden Society, um, which is near and dear to my heart. My grandmother, um, Hildreth Morton, was a founding member of that. So I have always been um, a huge fan of Kathy's. And what I love about Kathy's talks, and you can, you maybe you've already heard her, um, is that it's people speak. It makes sense to me. Um, it's, you know, sometimes it's it's sciencey, but it's enough science to get you going down the rabbit hole of research and listening to what she's saying. And so if you adore her tonight, and I know you will, check out her podcast. She just did a great one with um, Dan. I can never say his name right, Kathy. However, it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just call him um, Dan from Chanticleer, the yeah. tree, the the, uh, the chair maker. So it was that a works. podcast. So and I love all of them. So you guys take some time, um, listen to Kathy tonight, and then um, please get addicted to her podcast because I can't live without it. So thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Heather. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pop up the PowerPoint for this and make sure everybody can see it. So let's go to slideshow and from beginning. Everybody sees that echinacea with a bumblebee on it. Great. Okay. So first I want to say thanks to Luke and Heather and Elvia and Maggie and everybody for having me here this evening and enjoyed Luke's talk and so happy that you mentioned uh, Rachel Carson and Silent Spring because Literally, as I'm sitting in my house, where she wrote it is two miles away from me. <laughs> and so she's a personal hero of mine and near and dear to me. So um, we're first going to talk about the first part, a bit about what we can grow in our gardens and, and select in our gardens to support pollinators. And then in the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about what Homestead um, is offering. And then we'll take some more Q&A. And since we had a little bit of a, a late start, a 10 minute late start, I set my alarm for about 8.15 to jump into the Q&A. Hopefully we'll, we'll pretty much stay on schedule. And um, I'm, I'm here till 8.30 at least. And if we go over time, great. <laughs> and if we still have questions after that, I'm willing to stay late and answer all those questions. So um, do stick with us. And I heard there was a great raffle prize, so. We'll check that out too at the end. All right, so we're talking in the Here We Grow series about planting for pollinators and make sure that my program can advance. There we go. So first question that we normally get when we're talking about um, pollinator plants is what native plants can I plant in our area, in this eco region, in Maryland, in the Piedmont, in your little niche? So uh, we have to kind of go back to the drawing board and define what is a native. So in Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy's great book, The Living Landscape, they have defined native very broadly. 
and their definition is a native is a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time that's developed a complex and essential relationship with the physical environment and other organisms in it in a given ecological community. And there's one word I would add to this definition, and that would be probably instead of essential relationship, I might add beneficial relationship. <laughs> You can have a bad relationship and evolve with somebody. But yeah, I would think I would add the word beneficial somewhere in there. Um, so they're not defining native by what was planted on this piece of land before Columbus arrived, before the Native Americans came to the con continent, uh, or colonial time. So there's a lot of people who have different definitions and time spans for natives, they're defining a native plant by its relationship to the environment and other organisms in it, which I love this more broad definition of native. Um, it gives us a much bigger palette to work with and makes us look at really the essential reasons why we would want to plant natives. And that's because they have a relationship to something in that environment. And we want to take advantage of that. So really quickly, I want to talk about the principle of right plant, right place. So it doesn't matter if it's a native plant, if you plant it in the wrong place in your ecosystem, it's going to fail. So I hate when I hear people say that native plants are great because they're drought resistant or deer tolerant or some other thing like that. That's not a, a blanket statement and true across all types of native plants. And a great native plant that does well on the Delaware Eastern Shore is not going to do well in my dry woodland garden. That's <laughs> just not going to do well. They both might be native to Maryland, but you need to plant them in the right place in their, in their preference, in their habitat. So first you want to ask, where was that plant originally in its soil type? Was it sandy soil? Was it clay soil? Was it well draining? Was it on the side of a mountain? Was it in shale, limey? You know, our Western Western Maryland natives are very different um, than what we have here in Central and Eastern Maryland. And then the soil moisture level. So a lot of our native plants are moisture loving plants and they wanna sit in a bit of wet, but still have good drainage. And a lot of us who have huge old trees on our lots, have, that moisture gets wicked up by the tree roots. We don't wanna take away our trees, but we wanna look for plants that like a more dry environment. And then of course you need to know sun exposure. Is it a full shade plant? Can it take some sun? Can it take afternoon beating down sun? What can it take as far as sun exposure? Wind exposure, not so much of a, a um, characteristic we need to worry about here in Maryland but or Delaware, but it's good to know. And then your cold exposure is your USDA planting zone. So that's usually where it says on the tag uh, that it is can take cold down to um, a couple nights below freezing for our zone seven, zone six, and some a little bit of zone eight in our region. And then heat and humidity. So there are some natives, and I'm thinking about bleeding heart dicentra eczemia, the native bleeding heart in particular, that are ephemeral uh, because they can't take our summer heat and humidity. They come up in the spring, beautiful flowers, do a great blooming job, and then when the summer heat and humidity comes in, they kind of just melt away and disappear. So that's a lot of our spring ephemeral native plants, and then you'll need to know that hey, this isn't going to stay in my heat and humidity. I need something else to pop in on that place where there'll be a blank spot in the summertime. Okay, so after we've looked at our environment and what our yards and gardens are like and then tried to match them with some native plants, I want to talk really quickly about the idea of keystone species. And this is kind of a, getting a little bit into a controversial <laughs> area now, but there are certain species of plants that are so beneficial across a spectrum of uh, different environments that we uh, as a native lovers would say you need at least one of these if not several of these on your property if you can fit them in and one of the keystone species here for our eastern native woodland um, and piedmont region are oak trees 
So, and I know a lot of you are like, I can't fit an oak tree in. I live on less than a quarter acre lot and I have five near 100 year old oak trees. <laughs> and I'm able to still garden around those huge oak trees and have baby oak trees popping up. Yes, every once in a while. Um, and I'll still probably plant one more oak tree before I leave this earth. So there'll be something there after me. So um, I'm gonna highly recommend at least a white oak or a southern red oak or one variety of oak to be added to your landscape. Might not grow up to be uh, uh, 70 to 100 feet during your lifetime, but maybe during your grandchildren's lifetime. All right, and so also in this talk, I wanna note, we wanna talk about pre-pollinators, <laughs> not just pollinators when we have them in our garden. So we see beautiful butterflies, hummingbirds, and uh, native bees and native flies, but we need to support the pre-pollinators and that is in particular caterpillars and um, baby uh, birds at their baby stage and they eat primarily protein. So just like human babies, we, they need to grow big and strong and they need a great protein source um, and the birds do. So they are eating caterpillars. And what are caterpillars eating? They're eating many of the native plants in their environment. And so you'll go out and you'll see on wild, wild violets there, that there are bites taken out of them. And then I've just listed a few great, uh, I'm going to call it caterpillar food sources here, poplar, willow, elm, clovers, and and plantain. And on this list, I'm going to say wild violets, clovers, and plantain are considered to most of us to be weeds in our garden. So I think we should kind of change our mindset and think of them as, as pre-pollinator or baby pollinator food sources and maybe have a little more tolerance of some of these uh, in our lawns and turf grass. So again, that's the wild violets, clovers, and plantain. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a few quick nectar sources um, just a few plant ideas to add, and I'm just going to do one per season. Um, so, and these are just some of my favorite nectar sources that I, I just love that any, I think almost anybody small garden um, to a large garden can have in their landscape. So my first choice is a redbud tree and the eastern redbuds are pollinated by many types of native bees and also loved by honeybees. And bonus, they are also larval food for several species of moth caterpillars and one species of butterfly eat the leaves. And the most amazing thing I saw a couple springs ago is I went out and you see once the red bud leafs out, they have those beautiful heart-shaped leaves. It looked like somebody went out with a hole punch and <laughs> punched perfectly circles out of all my red bud leaves on the lower part of my tree. And that was a bee. <laughs> and so he just carved those little holes in there and he was taking the perfect circles back um, as food source. So I thought that was really, really cool. And I don't mind a few holes in my red bud tree leaves and hopefully you won't either. All right, so our next is our favorite summer nectar source. And this is the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. There are several types of com several types of milkweed, not common milkweed, several types of milkweed uh, native to our state and region. Um, this one, as you know, is uh, a great source uh, for of nectar for bumblebees, honeybees, digger bees, house bees, wasps, flies, swallowtail butterflies, monarch butterflies, skippers, fritillarias, and again, a great food source for larval caterpillars of the monarch. And so you'll go out one day and you'll see little tiny, looks like little white specks on the leaves and looks like little plastic pellets. And then they will hatch open and then you'll start to see the monarch caterpillar munching on those leaves and then a little chrysalis form underneath. And then eventually you'll have a few monarchs. What I love about the common milkweed is when I walk by it, it smells like honey, like just your blast of honey in your face. And I call them my bee balls in the garden because I'm like, I don't know when the monarchs have a chance to get any of that nectar because it's like all just a giant ball of bees sitting there in the garden. 
All right, so let's talk about an autumn nectar source, so asters. There are thousands of aster varieties and there are hundreds that are native to our eastern uh, woodlands and the eastern shore environment. Um, so just showing a couple here, there's lots of cultivars as well, which we can get into maybe in the Q&A section, but they're beneficial for long, be long tongue bees, honeybees, bumblebees, butterflies, bee flies, short tongue bees. I love the long tongue and the short tongue. It's very descriptive, right? <laughs> and surfid flies. Uh, what's great about asters is they're one of the last things to bloom in the autumn, like usually October into November. Um, and a lot of the rest of our garden has kind of gone to sleep. So asters really give you length in that season and supporting the pollinators right when they need it most, when they're the most scarce for food sources. And it also is a larval caterpillar um, source for New England um, aster in particular is a larval caterpillar source. So that's, that's one variety I would definitely not live without in my garden. All right, and then I just want to give some quick winter tips um, so if you're trying to support pollinators in your garden, you want to keep the seed heads and the plant stalks up. So this is my echinacea next to my little backyard pond. You can see my busy traffic corner in the background right there. Um, so I love the look of dried seed heads. It's very dramatic in the, in the winter time, but I'm leaving it up for the bird, birds to access the seed heads and get food there. But the stalks of our native, um, Echinacea, black-eyed Susan, Joe pie weed, anything with a hollow stem is where our native bees and beetles are wintering over. So they're generally below the 18 inch mark. So down here in this section, they're cutting a slit, they're tucking themselves inside and that's where they winter over. So if you do a big cleanup in the fall and cut back all your perennials and then chuck them out with your landscape waste, you're getting rid of all your native bees and beetles and all your great pollinators are going out. Um, so if you like a super neat garden, not judging, <laughs> if you like a super neat garden, if you like to put your garden to bed for the winter time, what I recommend is if you cut everything back, make a pile. So make a, like a, a shrub uh, and stem pile and keep that maybe next to your compost pile. And then once the weather t uh, warms up to consistently being in the 50s in the spring, then you can chop that up and put that in your compost pile or send it out with your landscape waste. Um, otherwise, I just leave mine up and do my cut back in springtime. And then provide a water source. So Luke didn't talk about this in his talk, but I have a rain barrel at the bottom of my downspouts and sometimes when I go out there to dip my watering can in and water my garden, I have to wait my turn because honeybees are lined all around the lip of the rain barrel. Also, honeybees land in my pond on top of the lily pads and sip, 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 sip. <laughs> and so they're not the only pollinators who need a lot of water. Uh, so have a butterfly you can have a butterfly puddling area by just putting um, a low dish kind of half buried in the ground with some rocks and pebbles in it and sand and just a little bit of water. So you want to um, check that if we have a thunderstorm or something to make sure that it's not sitting in like an inch or two of water, but just enough that they could stand on the rocks and dip their proboscis in and get some water. Um, so and keeping my pond open, I have a recirculating fountain in there. Um, helps during the winter time so they get all wildlife, not just pollinators, can have access to a water source. All right, so I was just going to make a big pitch and say I am giving a talk on planting for pollinators on Wednesday, May 5th for Homestead at 7 p.m. and it's free and it's virtually on Zoom like this, not like my in-person talk at Homestead a few years ago where I sweated up a storm. Up there. <laughs> so you can just go to Homestead Gardens and sign up under upcoming events. And the, the examples I gave you of some of my favorite pollinator plants, we're going to go much more in depth. And I think my list is now 21. 
I was good. at first it was a top 10, then it became a top 15. So it keeps growing. So we're going to cram in as much as we can in that talk. So uh, if you're looking for a great pollinator, uh, native pollinator plants to add to your garden, sign up for that. And want to give you some quick further reading and sources. Um, sign up for Washington Gardener magazine. My magazine covers DC, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, a little bit of Pennsylvania, a little bit of West Virginia and it's mainly the mid-atlantic growing area and yes this is a native flower on the cover of the tropical gardens theme issue and extra points if you put in the chat what that flower is <laughs> it looks like an exotic but it is native and our pollinators do love it so i also recommend going on garden tours um, i know annapolis secret garden tour um, i'm not sure if it's happening this year maybe elvia or maggie can can tell us is a great place to check out natives that do well in, in urban and city gardens. Go to your local public gardens. We have so many wonderful public gardens in the DC and Philadelphia area to visit with great examples of native plantings. You have the Adkins Arboretum um, right across the bridge um, from Annapolis, so a great day trip. Uh, follow other local gardeners on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I'm going to give a, a couple um, links in a little bit. And then both of Doug Tallamy's books, um, Bringing Nature Home, gives a, a good background and reasoning why you want to have these plants in your garden. But the, his newer book, Nature's Best Hope, I recommend for the um, homeowner because it's more of a prescription of here's what to plant and how to do it. It's a much easier to understand and accessible book. All right, now we're going to talk, oh, and Heather can jump in anytime she wants to on this part. <laughs> so just about, one thing, Kathy. So um, one of our um, one of our folks here said, Kathy, a uh, couple of them said that the flower on that magazine cover was the passion flower. Is that right? Yes, Passiflora okay. incarnata. So Pat and Kathy know what they're talking about. Another Kathy. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. So uh, a little bit about Homestead Gardens Native Habitat Center. Um, so here's a new logo for it. Looks gorgeous. I love. Okay. Let's just brag about the Maryland flag. Let's just brag about. We have the best flag in the nation. Let's. <laughs> yes. So Native Habitat Center is established to connect our customers to meaningful, sustainable, and resilient plant material that will promote habitat for our eco regional biodiversity. That was a mouthful, but that's just to say that what Homestead is going to be offering, you know, and what Heather already said, not going to have neonics in it, going to support our native biodiversity, our wildlife, and our pollinators. And you wouldn't mind taking it, putting it in your nose, smelling it, <laughs> eating it, and having it in your garden. All right. So, she had a couple slides that I wanted to share from Heather's talk that she talked about resilience. And I really connect with this. We, we, I was gonna say we're starting to emerge now from um, the COVID pandemic. We're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and we can talk about resilience and the ability to recover from or adjust to easy change and difficulties, toughness, physical or emotional elasticity is resilience. And I think that's a great principle to teach and adhere to and talk about not just for ourselves, but in our landscapes as well. So there's a lot of doom and gloom. I'm a member of several green organizations and I go to a lot of talks <laughs> and a lot of them are, and a lot of the um, documentaries I watch are like bad, 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 doom and gloom. The earth is doomed, blah, blah, blah. And then they don't give you too much to do about it. <laughs> so I always like to have some takeaways of what we can do. And guess what? It's not, you know, uh, uh, inevitable. You know, we can turn things around. Things can go down for 10 years, but things can go up. It's all a bell curve, right? So we can stop things in their track now and start implementing change. We don't have to settle for what's happening right now. And little things matter. You know, if you have a little bit of a rain garden, if you put in a, a little patch of pollinator plants, 
then your neighbor down the street is like, that's pretty cool. I want to have pollinators in my garden. And then they do it. And then they do it. And then they do it. It's so funny when I walk around neighborhoods to see plants that have migrated and that they just didn't pick up from one garden or reseed themselves into another garden. I can see when somebody dug up some irises and gave some extras to a neighbor and then that gave, that neighbor gave them to somebody else and you're like, all these three blocks have the same purple iris and it started with one gardener. <laughs> and so you could be that one person that divides and gives away and shares plants with your neighbors and inspires them with, with your landscape. Right, and I'm gonna uh, just go, finish up the slides on the Native Habitat Center. Um, just say that Homestead is saying that we do, we do it for today and for tomorrow and talking a little bit more about resilience um, and thinking about future generations. And there's a Homestead Gardens Native Habitat Group that Heather is the admin for. So if you're on Facebook, go to the Homestead Gardens page or Homestead Gardens Native Habitat Group. And she has some cool and great posts up there and you can interact, you can post questions from today, you can talk to others in the region and same thing on Instagram. So if you're a big Instagram user, follow at Native Habitat Center. So that's a, that one's a pretty easy one to remember. And um, this quickly is my contact information. I'll pop that up in the chat once I stop sharing here. And Heather had mentioned the podcast Garden DC. And we've done a couple episodes of the podcast about native um, gardening. So check out those in particular. Our last one that she was talking about was about container gardening in particular, which is something that's really accessible for people who are in small spaces and about in apartments or condos or townhouses. So start off with a few containers and then build on to that. And I'm going to close out my PowerPoint so I can see the chat and I can pop in my contact information there. And maybe I'll ask um, Elvia if you saw any questions in particular for me. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, I see no. somebody asked if it was recorded. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. great. Yeah. And then I see the passion flower. All right. So um, I, I do have one little thing to say, though. Um, and this kind of goes back to more a little bit more to what Luke was talking about. But um, um, you all know that um, Anne Arundel County um, offers to spray neighborhoods for mosquitoes. Mm. And and Luke, you can step in here at any time, but we're very concerned about what's in that pesticide, um, not only for the, you know, the, <laughs> the unintended consequences of killing pollinators, but also the harm that it, that it's, that these uh, materials may be doing to people, because it's yes. not, it's, it's a mixture of chemicals and the mixture of chemicals is what isn't being, isn't being studied really. I don't know, yeah. you want to say anything else about that, either of our panelists? I can say that there's also a sign up on the Maryland State site, and sorry, I don't have the, the link available, but you can probably Google it, where you can say, I have a water garden, which I do, or you have a stream bed or something else, and you have to legally be informed if any of that spraying happens in your neighborhood or around you. Um, so you saw the, on the, one of the slides, my water garden. So if one of those spray trucks came through and I wasn't informed, they could be in huge trouble. <laughs> so, so that's one of the things in the regulations is, and it doesn't mean, uh, if you don't have a water garden, you can still sign up for that alert, pre-alert list if you had some other type of pre-existing condition or something else. And owning honeybees <laughs> would be one of those. Also, you could just say, I am vulnerable to pesticides. Like, uh, who is it? You know, <laughs> so sign up to get that pre-alert. But yeah, that's very concerning about the blanket spraying. And we could have like a whole other session about um, fighting mosquitoes and not having them in their landscape. I am mosquito candy. They love me. <laughs> but <laughs> I did not have one mosquito bite 
in the last two years in my garden and I'm out there all the time and I have a water garden, I have rain barrels, I have everything. And that's mainly using the BTI, the um, mosquito dunks and mosquito bits that prevent mosquitoes from breeding. That's also making sure my gutters are clean, my downspouts are clean, there's no sitting water anywhere, everything is recirculating water or switched out. Like my rain barrels, I just make sure that they're emptied out every week or so that, that mosquitoes don't have a chance to lay eggs there. It takes 10 Luke? days, it takes 10 days for the larva to become a mosquito. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wanna to add to that, Luke, the concern, the health concern? It's like to say that um, Kathy said some great things. If you have water and you don't want mosquitoes to grow from it, you can use mosquito bits or dunks, which are BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis. And it only, um, it's a targeted pesticide that only, uh, it's a, bio, a biotic, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's a biological pesticide. It's not a chemical pesticide. And it, it attacks only a very narrow range of insects which do, do not include bees. So that's the bees. You know, they're, the county, the, 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 the spraying people try to sell it uh, because uh, they don't want people to get, you know, Zika and all these other diseases that are carried by mosquitoes. But my gosh, the chances of getting those are so slim and the chances of getting ill in, in a lot of even worse ways um, from these pesticides is, is much, um, much greater. So. Yeah, and I'd like to add that I didn't even get involved in any of this sort of um, um, activism for uh, pollinator protection until my bees were killed by some overzealous commercial um, commercial mosquito killing outfits like um, Mosquito oh. and, and Mosquito Squad, who were like giving free sprayings to my neighbors and you know, my hives just lost all of their foragers. All the bees that were outside of the hive were dead. Yeah. And that's what really got me active because I called the EPA, I spoke to other people. I spoke to the Maryland Department of Agriculture. They all didn't care. Mm -hmm. that, that sent me on this uh, mission to try to see what we could do to help save our crops. Yeah. And I think about the unskilled labor, the guys who are out there spraying this stuff without a clue as to what they're being exposed to. Yeah, protecting the workers too. And everybody who uh, administers pesticide in the state has to have a pesticide applicator's license. Mm -hmm. So with your digital camera, if you see a neighbor have a you know, mosquito spraying done and you, see, you can take a picture of their truck and their driver's license, the, the license on the back of the the vehicle and report that if you see overspray, which I've seen happen very often where they're doing it on a breezy day, they're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to overspray onto other people's property, which they're like, well, it will just be a little extra generous. <laughs> and then, um, so they have to go through a training program and uh, get uh, educate, education credits, CEUs every year uh, for their license. Um, but you know, a license can be revoked if they if they find out that they're not applying it in the ways that are supposed to. And also if they're not doing it in the amounts, like, you know, they're, it's very regulated as far as dosage. So most of them are very careful because they don't want to get sick from it. But, you know, some people are sloppy workers. That's the way uh, all professions are, right? There's there's people who are by the book exemplary, and then there's others who are just like, well, you know, they're not paying me much, so I'm just going to throw this around. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, Heather. Do do you have the? Do you actually have the basket with you? I'm not. I am. Okay. In well, it Delaware. doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> Opening the new store. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. we have a photo. We have a yeah. photo that Maggie can put up on the screen. So that's the raffle basket. <laughs> oh, is that my office? I miss my office. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bunch of goodies from Homestead Gardens. Um, and so everybody out there listening, so be quick at, at your keyboard there. So okay. shall, shall we just go ahead with the question? Yeah, did you, um, did, do you wanna go with Luke's? I mean, that was such a good question and 
super invoking. Well, if nobody gets the answer, then we'll go to another question. How's okay. that? Okay. He said it in the first three sentences of his <laughs> chat today. Ooh, okay. Mm. Oh, okay. wait. Oh. Well, Luke, do you want to say what the question is, the trivia question for the raffle basket? Oh, um, oh boy. All right. What, what two creatures pollinate bananas? Mm -hmm. Come on, audience. Anybody remember? <laughs> Don't Google, don't Google, that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna need another question, but but what's the right answer? Wait, somebody type something. Oh, oh. oh Bonnie. Bonnie, I think was the first one to answer. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Bonnie B. Bonnie B answered bats and birds. Is that right, Luke? That's absolutely right. Okay. Bonnie yeah. wins the beautiful basket. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So if you come <laughs> by the Davidson Mill store. Um, pop up to customer service and let them know that you won. Um, that uh, gorgeous basket is all yours. Great. And congratulations. Mm -hmm. And that was a great question. People always forget the bat. And I just, mm -hmm. I mean, it just makes perfect sense how long that tongue is. Then, you know, they move around. Yeah. It's yeah. genius. And, and yeah. some bats are teeny. Some bats are no bigger than this. It's amazing. Yeah. They're so cute too. Yeah. And well, if you think of fruit bats, I mean, Duh. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any final um, words from either of our panelists or from Heather? Do you want to go first, Luke? Or I just want to say I'm so grateful that you guys are interested in helping the pollinators. I'm just so thankful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kathy? Uh, so I was just going to say uh, to get out there and garden. And uh, the next few weeks, we're going to have our cicada swarms, and it's going to be really interesting and cool. <laughs> and don't be afraid. It's just going to, and remember that this is like the solar eclipse, right? This only happens once every 17 years, and it really only happens in our region. Like, there's cicadas in other countries, but not like this, not like the 17 year swarm cycle. So people are coming from other places to come and see this. Oh, how long does it last? Remind us how long it lasts. Um, it's going to be generally May 15th to June 15th, but there's going to be some early guys and girls and some mm -hmm. later. So basically a good two weeks solid and then, you know, like a, a week on each end of, you know, a little bit of buzzing and, and still getting their eggs done and everything for the next cycle. So the mayor of Annapolis said to me, okay, I had to deal with the pandemic. I've had all these things I have to do. And now the locusts are here. <laughs> They're not locusts. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Technically not locusts. And then um, I had, we had Mike Ralph talk recently and he's, he's a great University of Maryland entomology professor and uh, they're edible, not just mm -hmm. for birds and your pets and stuff, but they taste like shrimp. And if you have a shrimp allergy or a shellfish allergy, do not eat them. It's the, it's literally the same. Oh yeah, oh that is exactly what's going to make me not eat a cicada. That's, <laughs> that's the ticket. That's the thing that was going to not put that on the end of a skewer. Mm -hmm. So yes. there are a couple of comments in the, in the chat about this. Uh, Rita wants to know why, why is it just in this region? And Kathy once uh, said that, that they had cicadas in Clarion, Pennsylvania. Yep. Last year. Yeah. So yeah. in the, in, in, so Mike Ralph had told us that because of the ice age and the glaciers, it's got to be below that glacier line, which is basically uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey down. And uh, so that's why you only see it in that. And it has to be in woodland areas. So eastern woodland forest were the perfect habitats for cicadas to develop. Um, so there's different broods. We're brood X or 10 here in the mid-Atlantic and then Tennessee Valley and a little bit of Kentucky and then there's Ohio. So there's different broods that are on different cycles around um, basically east of the Mississippi, but below, I think, I would say lower New York state, right? Um, and so if you're a forested area and moderate, like we are, we, we are like the perfect storm for them. It's just exciting to have nature as news. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy about that. Yeah. 
and I think there's going to be some super excited uh, pets. <laughs> oh yeah, fattest chickens ever. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I just want to remind everybody that uh, Luke's organization is having uh, an event here soon um, that anybody can zoom into, right, Luke? Another discussion coming up in the next couple of weeks. A limit to a hundred people, so. Uh... I don't know. I guess, yeah, if you want to hear from one of the researchers who discovered that uh, or proved that we had this huge increase in the toxicity of the, mm -hmm. she'll be speaking from California. Okay, so I put uh, your your organization's um, URL in, in the chat. Okay, and it might even be better to just email me directly if... Um, okay. You want to put the email that you want to use in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay. And then um, I'll see, you know, I have to keep it below 100 people. Okay. And then uh, just one final word too. Um, uh, we're uh, going to have a third um, session with Homestead Gardens sometime in May. We don't have the date yet. Um, and it's going to be about food and flowers together. And we're calling it beautiful and delicious. So stay tuned for that. What am I forgetting, Maggie? Anything? No, I think you got it. Okay. Thank you all so much. This was great. I feel like yeah. I learned some really valuable information about pollinators. Yeah. So don't go here. Oh, there's there's uh, Luke's email address. Okay. All right. So Thanks we're good. Everyone. We're good to go. All right. Thank yeah. you, everyone, for Congratulations, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.